go back to Think Tech. Uh, there's a global connections, and uh, we are talking with Russell Hanma this morning um, about the G7 in, in Hiroshima. And uh, we're going to hear about uh, the plans for it and the aspirations for the economic framework for Indo-Pacific. Welcome to the show, Russell. Nice to have you here. You've been on Think Tech so many times. We've learned so much about foreign policy, especially economic foreign policy. Um, welcome, welcome aboard. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank you for inviting me today. I know this is an important subject uh, regarding what's happening in the G Summit uh, summit meeting in Hiroshima, Japan, right now. And as you know, the meeting already started, and President Joe Biden already had a bilateral meeting with uh, Prime Minister Kishida. And right after that, they followed with the Quad meeting with since the Australia Prime Minister's there. India's prime ministers there, and uh, since we invited uh, uh, South Korea uh, as well, Vietnam and Australia uh, uh, prime ministers, so they're having this quad meeting there uh, to discuss that uh, in regarding to the Indo-Pacific uh, region for the South Pacific Sea, and uh, basically this uh, uh, G7 summit is really crucial and very important uh, in in where in terms of worldwide. Uh, policy to bring peace and security because we don't want to create a uh, World War III. And as you know, the situation has changed with the situation in the Ukraine war and uh, Russian uh, aggression. And the same thing with China's aggression. Matter of fact, uh, yesterday, the U.S. Congress had a special hearing regarding to the aggression of China. Uh, so everybody's more concerned what's happening uh, geopolitically and global-wise. Oh, these are exciting times. Now, Joe Biden uh, canceled part of his trip. Uh, what, what part did he cancel and why? Um, and how does that affect the meeting? I think uh, prior to that, uh, he wanted to go back to Washington, D.C. for the, uh, the U.S. congressional hearing regarding to our national deficit, uh, increasing the uh, deficit uh, ceiling uh, for our budget. So I think he cut the uh, plan short. He was going to visit. Uh, I believe Australia and Papua New Guinea after that. So uh, basically, so he's just gonna uh, stay for the G7 summit meeting. And basically, uh, since the European Union leaders are there also, so if they can come up with some kind of consensus so that everybody's on the same page where uh, we can move forward. And I know that United States is hosting the APEC conference uh, this year in November is gonna be the leaders and the CEO summit. And the summer in August, they're going to have the minister and the U.S. senior uh, official meeting, and they're going to have the Women in Empowerment and Economic Forum based on indigenous uh, uh, people. That includes Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, Eskimos, Native Indians. So they're going to talk about the Native Indigenous Americans that uh, uh, based on what uh, we have in history for United States. So I think it's going to be a good... Uh, APEC conference coming up after this G7 summit. So we can move forward with uh, President Joe Biden's uh, economic uh, framework for Indo-Pacific uh, region, which is similar to what uh, we try to do with uh, TPEC, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. And since we pulled out when the, our past president, Donald Trump, uh, wanted to focus more on the bilateral status, so we pulled out it from the uh, TTEP. But we wanted to rejoin the comprehensive progressive uh, TPP. And now with the new administration, I guess uh, we're going to call it economic framework for Indo-Pacific. But well, they're basically the same members with the uh, TPP. Plus, we got India and Fiji involved with the economic framework. So whoever wants to be part of our economic framework is, is welcome to join us. And I think that's what uh, President Joe Biden wants to relay that to, uh, yeah. to the leaders. Yeah. Who are the, the seven in G7? The G7 is basically that was formulated in 1970s uh, when there was a lot of turmoil uh, with the oil shock and everything and what was going on. It includes England, France, Britain, Italy, United States, Canada. And so uh, basically they're the, and Germany, and they're the uh, power nation in Japan. And this year, I guess Japan is hosting the uh, G7 summit 
last year was in Munich in Germany. So uh, I think it's given uh, everybody a, a global voice of concern for the leaders to kind of uh, literate what's going on in the global affairs right now. So I think it's a good thing that uh, they're getting together. And I'm glad they did invite uh, countries like South Korea, India, Australia, uh, and Vietnam and the European Union to join in this meeting. So uh, it's basically, uh, I guess they wanted to see which direction they want to go in cause of the Ukraine war with the Russian uh, invasion and the aggression that we've seen in China with the South China Seas and uh, all that trade concerns that we have that with China and uh, Man Man Island and so-called their 9-9 boundary issues that needs to be resolved and based on the United Nations uh, freedom of navigation and the law of the sea. So those kind of issues has to be addressed. And even with the situation with the North Korea and with Kim and Un's regime and coming up with plastic missiles, uh, getting the technology and they're scaring everybody around the Korean Peninsula, especially last month, they shot one over Hokkaido, northern Japan. So that kind of triggered an alarm system for them. And that kind of scared, worried uh, Japanese nationals. So that is a big concern also. Yeah. So uh, not too long ago, the G20 met. I think it met in India, no? Uh, what's the relationship of the G20 and the G7? Actually, the G7 is the top seven countries in the world. Like that has the, uh, they're more the uh, superpower countries. Uh, and the G20 is a 20 country. So India is a member in the top 20. Hopefully we're wondering if in the future, uh, maybe India or if China gets their act together, they can join the G8, just like Russia. Russian Federation was part of the G8. And what happened was because of the situation, the crime area and the invasion, you know, back in 19, uh, 2013, uh, uh, with the invasion of Crimea, the G7 leaders decided to uh, get Russia out. And that's when Vladimir Putin was still the president. And uh, so actually, G Russia was kicked out of the G8 and now it's still G7. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, you know, you talk about an economic framework and it sounds like uh, <clears throat> this is a, a core point. I mean, there, there are a lot of issues. You identified some and they're really important global issues. Uh, geopolitical issues, issues that will define the future of the world, really. But what, what is the, quote, economic framework? What is that? Um, and how do you make an economic framework? Actually, it's basically, we wanted to coordinate everybody who's in the economic framework for Asia, Indo-Pacific region, to understand, have a free trade, uh, free, on, more like in terms of uh, moving goods and services, cooperation, having a communication for security, bringing peace to the region and prosperity. And uh, unity actually is a voice of concern for unity so that everybody can be on the same page uh, and kind of move forward. And it is based on dem democracy. And uh, so we can move from that kind of direction. And it's based on the uh, the the um, world order, the liberal world order, um, and it is not based on invading your neighbor. So I I get the feeling that one of the threads uh, in the G seven meeting is uh, you know what to do about Russia, what to do about its invasion and aggression uh, on Ukraine and its threat to Western Europe. Um, I, I expect there'll be plenty of discussion about that because all the countries uh, in the G7 that you identified uh, would be concerned about that. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's not only the G7, but I'm talking about in terms of Europe, too, with the European Union and England, because, uh, you know, even with the Brexit, they're still part of uh, European Union and uh, they're still doing their everyday business with them and they're part of the European culture and union. So uh, they understand that and uh, they're still moving forward with positivity. And hopefully uh, my my uh, long range plan when I've been planning a strategic business plan for APEC for Indo-Pacific region was I wanted to bring European Union and APEC organization, which European Union has 28 countries plus Brexit 
And uh, APEC has 21 countries, and we want to include India, hopefully, for this upcoming APEC conference in uh, San Francisco. We can announce that India can be a, by, uh, 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 one of the members, be the 22nd member of APEC, and move on that way. And so that we want to bring the my idea is having Europe and Asia kind of work together on the One Belt, One Road initiative, what China was trying to push. And hopefully the organization can do it in a fair way and uh, in according to the rule of law, the international rule of law. So small countries can work with the big countries. So the small mm -hmm. countries, the developing countries can benefit and get equal share of the uh, Europe versus Asia, the infrastructure development, moving goods and services, uh, those kind of aspects. And I think it's a better meant for the humanity in the future. I, th I think in the long range, maybe it might take 50 years from now, but we will see a peaceful uh, one belt, one road initiative, the old Silk Road trade that China had in the back when uh, Genghis Khan actually built the... Uh, a silk Road back in the 13th uh, century, where he was, uh, you know, terrorizing the Asian regions and uh, bringing sure. trade to the East and the West. But uh, those kind of aspects gonna have to be brought up again, and hopefully in the future we can have a peaceful uh, way of uh, so there isn't any prejudice or they can, we can move on, and it's a better man for the humanity. And I think uh, Europeans understand that. And I think the agents are realizing that too. And uh, maybe the United States can be the intermediator to relay those messages. And I think that's what's happening in the G7 summit uh, meeting that uh, when we get in the West country, the European Union, who believes in the free trade and free democracy, that they can bring in those kind of good things to happen. Well, that's my like vision. It's all good. It, uh, we're talking about achieving a lasting peace. We're, we're talking about achieving, you know, a, a better global economy. Um, we're talking about, you know, prosperity uh, essentially everywhere. These are pretty lofty goals. Um, how much does the U.S. bring to that in these times? You know, we have mm, a divided Congress. We have a divided country. Uh, we have people in, in the Congress who oppose these things or who don't care about these things. Um, is, does Joe Biden have a full portfolio? Go to these meetings. Does he speak with, um, you know, enough authority to make a difference? Does the um, divided aspect in Congress and the country undermine that authority? I know that's a hard question, but I would like your thoughts about it, Russell. Well, you know, if you think back, uh, backtrack it. Uh, I know when they had the last G seven in uh, Munich, Germany. I think they pledged uh, roughly $600 billion for this uh, helping out the infrastructure development project, uh, uh, try to work with the, uh, the developing nation so these, uh, the world leaders can make a significant difference in terms of uh, worldwide uh, or in terms of globalization kind of concept. So I think that's a start. It's all part of uh, getting everybody in the same age to realize what the consequences are. And I think in the, everybody has, those country has their domestic policies. They got to meet the fiscal and monetary policy and hopefully balance the budget. And they got to pay services to, to take care of their people and do their domestic demand at home. And if that feels good and they can do overseas and invest in overseas. And oh, right now only the, Jeez, you know, the developing nations, the superpower countries can do that. And we hopefully we want the developing nations, the G20 and all those other countries to realize that what the global leaders are trying to do right now. And hopefully the con congressional side can look at the picture. You know, we're always debating between the Republicans, the Democrats. Seems like we're always finding like cats and dogs in the U.S. Congress. But, you know, that's that's the things that they do over there. So from there, they're trying to iron out policies. And, uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans got to think, like, we, we're all Americans. We got we to do what's right for uh, be a global leader again. And hopefully we can uh, move forward that way and share our knowledge and share information abroad. 
because everybody wants to come to the United States and want to trade and do business. You know, we have our con- pros and cons here, but hey, in terms of business and quality of life, United States got a lot to offer, and we've been doing that for a century already. So, you know, it's hopefully that we can uh, put everybody in the global aspect and be fair. So we want our, our partners, our allies and friends to realize that the that, uh, United States is here to stay, and we are willing to work with you in a global aspect. And I th- that's what uh, Joe Biden sees, I believe, because he's been doing foreign policy for you know, he's a specialist and when, ever since he was a congressman, he became a state senator, and now he's a, he's a U.S. Uh, president. So I think he's got a lot of wisdom and knowledge, so he foresees that. And uh, I kind of uh, respect him for his, uh, his vision, and uh, I would like to move forward with that, uh, his vision as well, and hopefully bring back United States as a global leader again. And oh, very, uh, very noble more. thought, very noble thought, very important thought. So many international issues, you know, the world is all interdependent, whether we like it or not. And this is good for his campaign, you know, to to take the four on um, on international meetings like this. You named the five or six of altogether. It's quite a few of them. And um, and, and and to make that his his pivot, if you will, make that an important point. You know, in, in the um, domestic politics, uh, there's a lot of argument about domestic issues, but it, I believe it's very good for him to discuss international issues. It's another part of his um, appeal to America, as you say, to come together. So question, you know, we have immigration issues. The immigration issues are not only in Latin America and on our southern border. Immigration issues are in Europe and perhaps in, in a number of places around the world. And people are suffering. That's why they they migrate. Um, and what about this conference and the other conferences you mentioned? Do they address um, human flow in Ai Weiwei's term? Uh, human flow and the migration of people, sometimes uh, voluntary but m- often involuntary, um, around the world. Is this a subject on the agenda? Uh, that's a good point there, Jay. Um, I haven't seen the actual uh, agenda, but uh, that's a big concern that we have in terms of immigration. I'm sure that the Europeans see that as well, that you've seen the migration. All these people want to come into Europe, uh, especially with Ukraine and what's happening with the war over there. So I know the Europeans uh, has welcomed all these Ukrainian immigrants uh, crossing the border, especially Poland, because uh, Poland seen what happened with the Cold War. So now they're willing to give back and support their neighbors. And I'm glad that all these European countries have stepped up to the plate. And as well, we've been having a lot of Ukrainian immigrants come to the United States, especially if they have family here. But even with the situation in Latin America, uh, I know that they just, uh, the immigration that Donald Trump had, there's, I forgot the exact name they call it, but the act has expired. So there's all these immigrations, uh, people are waiting in the borderline to be processed so they can uh, come up with their uh, uh, sanctuary over here in the United States and uh, come in that way, with, especially with families. So I think uh, we're trying to open up the border now and hopefully if we can build some kind of infrastructure to have the housing for these kind of people so, and create jobs for them. And uh, since they'll be having English as their second language, so they got to kind of blend into our, 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 our system here and in, in, in the way of our life. And I'm sure that, you know, we're an immigrant state, so we all been doing this for the past generations. And uh, we welcome immigrants because they come up with the uh, new ideas. They, they work hard. And the jobs that we don't want to do, they're going to be willing to do it and build their family especially the first generation and the second generation is going to get better off and get educated. They're going to go off and get their college degrees and be a good law-abiding citizen and contributing citizens for our United States. I see that. I see that with the Asian immigrants already. So, uh, you know, I have no problem with that. <clears throat> One other uh, issue, I think, uh, if, if you went uh, to UH uh, uh, on the Manoa campus and you talked to the um, journalism program in the School of Communication there, and you asked them what the most important global story was in our lifetime, uh, they would tell you without hesitation, the most important story is climate change because it's existential. 
Uh, and uh, I know there, you know, there are a lot of meetings around the world, a lot of organizations that are trying hard, um, you know, to to respond to climate change. But I wonder, in all the meetings you've mentioned, and especially in the G7 coming up in uh, Hiroshima, um, whether that is on the agenda, because that is a very important issue for all of us. Yeah, definitely, Jay. That is uh, part of the uh, agenda. Uh, it's just that we just been uh, uh, diverted in terms of because the crisis that we had with the war in Ukraine and uh, China's aggression there. So, but uh, there's a ministers that uh, of energy are getting together and they're talking about the sustainability uh, to put it into their uh, economic plan. Uh, remember that United Nations 17 SGD, the uh, sustainability goals that they had to put in that came out with. I'm sure they're incorporating some of those uh, 17 SDGs in there. And uh, that's what we did in the state of Hawaii. We passed a bill. Uh, matter of fact, I testified and I wrote those kind of measures and we have it uh, put it into the state plan. And in terms of coding effects, uh, we put those 17 uh, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals into our state plan. So that kind of brings up the, uh, the Paris Agreement, having a long range by year 2045, we should be fossil free. And even our uh, uh, in Detroit, there are three automakers, are, uh, the giant auto, they're all into electric cars now. The EVs are coming out and we want to promote more of a, a sustainability and an alternative energy source and all that. So, you know, it's working. It's, it's, it takes time. It doesn't happen overnight, but uh, our long range plans are being, uh, you know, a minister with our short range plans. So it's been, it's kind of moving forward in that direction. And I think all the developing nations are uh, moving forward in that sense. And the G7 is a good platform to address that and refocus again. So, uh, Russell, you drafted um, the uh, APEC master plan for the APEC that was uh, conducted a few years ago here uh, in Hawaii, um, which has, you know, long legs um, because APEC will continue around the various member nations uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so I wonder about the relationship of APEC, the APEC plan, and Hawaii um, in the G7. Uh, what, what, what kind of representation will we have? What kind of input will we have? Uh, what kind of interest do we have in the G7 meeting? Oh, yeah. Good thing you asked me, Jay. I know this is a high caliber meeting and uh, I know we're only the 50th state in the union, but uh, we do have a voice of concern. And uh, I've been kind of uh, drafting all these strategic business plans for the past when we hosted the uh, 2011 APEC Honolulu conference when uh, President Barack Obama was the president back then. And uh, we wanted the East West Center to be the uh, focal point. And we had our, our headquarters there, matter of fact. And I was kind of working with the East West Center and promoting this uh, more of bringing the air blank as a security measure because I was uh, uh, with the airship management services back then. And uh, but we did like Fuji film, Blair Blair, uh, we did McDonald's, uh, we did quite. It's just similar to like the Goodwear, Good Air uh, Air blend, But uh, we did the Olympics too on that one. So anyways, uh, that got, got me started with the APEC, and I got involved with the uh, APEC Business Advisory Council when we hosted the 2011, and I drafted a, a, a comment kind of a, a paper regarding to large enterprise sh should work with small and medium enterprise so they can uh, work out the supply chain issues. And that is a big concern with the G7 Summit is the supply chain issues right now. Because we don't want to rely on China alone, and Japan is bringing up the uh, artificial intelligence issues, and hopefully that was a good thing. Because I uh, last year we just came out with the uh, Chips and Science Act, which we're gonna spend roughly about two hundred sixty billion dollars invested, and out of that, two hundred billion is gonna go into research and development for the STEM projects, and other you know sixty million to be allocated to other. Uh, agencies so they can look into cyber spacing, security measures, uh, other, other uh, uh, intellectual, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, STEM projects that we can move forward with. 
So that is a good thing. And another thing is we want to bring up manufacturing for uh, Intel uh, semiconductors, uh, chips like that, that that's high, high caliber uh, chips that we need for uh, supercomputers and all that. So uh, basically, we want to bring manufacturing back to the United States. We don't want to rely on China alone. So this a, it's, it's a sticking point, too, because we've got Taiwan there, and Japan wants to come up with their own. Uh, they're bringing back their manufacturing of uh, uh, microchips and capabilities. So, But we want to work with Japan as well. And the United States is going to want to remember back in the 70s, I recall, when Silicon Valley, when the IBM's uh, was dominated at 64 RAM chips, and a lot of them were, were manufactured in Japan. IBM Japan controlled like 60% of the uh, 64 RAM chips in the 70s and 80s. And those are needed for, you know, those 286 computers, 390, those clone computers that came out back in there. And uh, before the uh, Microsoft came up with the uh, DOS functions and all those kind of things. Huh? But anyways, uh, Apple came up with their own Macintosh. But uh, we needed those 64K RAM chips. And a lot of them were controlled by Japan. and if Japan was, we had a trade war with Japan back then, so they're controlling the chips, and so we decided to manufacture our own chips in some in, in terms of supply chain issues. So same things happening right now with China, and they're controlling everything. So we got to bring back our capabilities back again, and I think this uh, uh, economic framework plan is calling for bringing manufacturing back for the uh, Chips and Science Act. So which is good, good sign. You know, although you, you come on Think Tech and talk about these meetings, uh, I'm not sure they're getting enough press in the American press uh, or in the Hawaii press. So what, what is your advice to the media about whether they should cover this and how, how deeply they should cover these meetings and the discussions that take place uh, between the leaders of state at these meetings? After all, you know, if you have meetings and you have countries talking to each other, you reduce the likelihood of aggression and war. Um, and so whatever the conversations are, uh, human beings, uh, countries, uh, leaders of countries getting together and expressing themselves in these meetings and rubbing shoulders and, and um, you know, having social engagement in these meetings, to me, is always a good thing. Um, but my question to you is, what, what, what can we do about, you know, passing the word making people um, more familiar, more aware of the meetings and what goes on at the meetings and what the meetings hope to achieve. I know it's happening, you know, good thing you asked me that question, Bill, but it's how the, how the media portrays it, you know, and the reporters without, and that, you know, it's how the consumers or the general public sees it. They're, they're not a news people like we are. You know, we're not up with, top of the global issues of what's happening locally and you know we're not into the news like most people are so busy occupied with their job taking care of their families they got their own personal problems or they got other daily chores they got so they can't if they have time and leisure or uh economically stable you know they're well off then they can look into that but i hope you know in terms of educating how the tv portrays it the reporters and I remember that one week, about two weeks ago when uh, King Charles had his coronation in England, that, that took out the whole worldwide kind of uh, dominance in terms of uh, media coverage. And, uh, you know, in terms of APEC, I hope the same thing kind of coverage does happen. But uh, I think in terms of it's the scope of uh, how the TV uh, reporters and the media the program directors, how they see it and how they're going to air it or not. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of an interest. And right now it's a geopolitical kind of issue. So every country is taking up what's happening and if it's going to affect their country or not, or, you know, in terms of their business or the quality, quality of life. So I think that's a big issue. And to me, I'm bringing this up because uh, I want the audience to know this is what's happening. I hope it doesn't create a World War III. And because of uh, what's happening with the situation. And to me, what's happening is they're breaking up factions of countries. Because uh, we have our G7 with the West countries, the European Union, and the Russia and China have their BRICS nation. Brazil, Russia, India, South Africa. 
and they formulate an agent infrastructure investment bank. Remember, like three or four, about uh, when was that was established? Must have been established in about 2016, about that time when they formulate the BRICS nation. And they got together in 2016 uh, Olympics in Brazil. And those, those leaders, the BRICS nation leaders, got together on the sideline and came up with this BRICS nation kind of coalition so they can go against the West. You know, go against America in terms of U.S. and the European Union's dominance in terms of trade and commerce. So a lot of countries that wasn't too happy with what's happening with the West countries, you know. So in, in terms of dollar currency, so China now wants to use UN as their dominant currency. Well, as the reserve the BRICS, currency for the world, their campaign. Yeah, exactly. And the BRICS nation is trying to push for that. And hopefully uh, they got. Iran and Saudi Arabia involved with it. So that's why in terms of G7 country, we invited India, Vietnam, as well as South Korea, and uh, Brazil uh, is kind of sitting, but you know, we, want, we want them to not go towards, uh, you know. Yeah, that's a very, very, China, very Russia. important policy point. Exactly, very important point so the made. geopolitical system is kind of shifting right now. And we, we want to make sure that, uh, they don't, there's no ramification. They don't regret what's going to happen. So we don't want to create this kind of animosity among the uh, world dominance, you know, in terms of global policy right now. But we want to, but that's what that's being brought up in the G7 right now. This is going to happen. This is the direction it's going to take. So other side, Russia and China and your partners and allies and friends, that's what the BRICS nation was, that's what they wanted to do. But now we have China coming I mean, India with us again with the G7 summit. So Maldi, President Maldi have to kind of uh, look into those kind of pro and con side because we want China, India to be on our side with the West. And uh, yeah, it is the- very important in this, in this issue. So, uh, Russell, how can we learn more about this? I know you wrote a newsletter. You should talk about that. And, uh, you know, maybe there are sources, websites, uh, and the like that people should look at so that they can, uh, you know, know more and uh, follow the action on the uh, these international meetings? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, in terms of Think Tech Hawaii show, I know we're so diversifying, so much knowledge, and we have so much intelligent people in Hawaii that are, you know, in terms of globally, in terms of issues that know, domestic issues as well. Uh, so they focus on speciality and you know in terms of our conversation we have with the global connection or that's our speciality so i think what the global uh, audience when they look at the think tech kawaii shows they have to pick and choose because we're so we make so many shows every day <laughs> throughout the years i'm sure jay you're so busy there so i think in ter- terms we we're kind of uh, overwhelming i would say our Think Tech Hawaii shows, and because uh, we've got a lot of knowledge and wisdom that people live in Hawaii. So that's what showcases us. We're a special island here. Special well, thank you, Russell. Island. Russell Hanma, the uh, draftsman of the uh, APEC Master Plan here in Hawaii, and somebody who follows these international meetings uh, every single time and comes and reports to us about it. Thank you so much, Russell. Yeah, thank you, Jay. It was uh, nice uh, talking to you. I just wanted to share this. Uh, since this is an important time, what's happening in the G7 summit in Hiroshima, Japan. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.